Today we'll be doing the uh, hot dog contest bar char, which is an exercise from chapter four of the book Visualize This by Nathan Yao. Uh, this is the data visualization class, information design one at San Francisco State. And today's uh, Wednesday, September 10th, 2014. But I think one uh, important concept that he talks about, okay, so the chapter is all about uh, looking things over time, right? Change over time. But one important distinction that he makes from the get-go is this one about temporal data that can be either discrete or continuous. And you can't see it now in the video, but if you remember this first page from that um, exercise that I did at San Jose State about analog and digital. So discrete and continuous are basically another definition of digital and analog. So discrete is um, digital because every unit is like finite. So that's why an abacus is a good example actually of a digital computer. Anything that's analog, it's actually continuous. So a sound wave or analog audio is continuous. And so the differences are you know, just happening all the time. And so a slide ruler, or in this case, this uh, proportion wheel is um, a, an example actually of an analog computer or something that's continuous. So when you have bars, I think he's going to talk about this. Um, if you have moments in time, like say every month, those are definitely, I think, more discrete. And it, in order to show maybe more continuous, you have to go like every day, maybe every minute, every hour, okay? Um, but that's a, good, that's a good distinction. That's why sometimes bar are good for, to show things over time. Sometimes they're not, okay? Sometimes a line might be much better. Okay, we talked about how um, a bar graph is really an area chart. So we're comparing, we're comparing heights, of course, but also we're comparing areas because the width should never change of each bar. Um, so let's just delve right into this, um, into this uh, assignment here. So let's see what it says. Um, it's about hot dog contest winners for every year and where these winners came from and so forth. So take this name hot dog and then read the file and get it from this URL. So let me just try to do that. Yeah, so this is the clean URL. So I just wanna see if this is there at all, right? Without even going into R. Um, oh, actually it does work. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Okay, so the file is actually called hot dog contest winners, right? Et cetera, with all these dashes. Now that's a pretty long name. So in the uh, book, what it does is says, well, let's try to make it a little shorter, deal with it a little, a little more easily by making this, I don't know if this is called a variable, but we're gonna just give it a shorter name. And the way we do that is without actually changing the file, but just by saying, we're gonna make this thing called hot dogs um, be whatever I tell it to be. So in this case, this particular little sign really just means equal, um, says that to read that uh, CVS file, comma separate fi a value file from this URL, right? And so from that point on, that data set is just gonna be treated as hot dogs, which is a lot simpler, right, than typing all that thing. Um, yeah, from a URL. Yeah, if you remember, when you go to R, it gives you two choices, right? You can either um, import data set from a text file, if you've already downloaded it, or from web URL. Mind you, web URL is still a text file, right? It just happens to sit in a server, right? And in fact, all web stuff is either a text file, really, or you know, a picture, right? I mean, in HTML, especially in websites, that's more or less the two uh, things. I mean, every, all the code is usually a text file anyway, uh, especially if you open it with a text editor, you just see all the text. Um, so, uh, so right now, I think even though it would be kind of a good exercise to go through this process of doing this, um, you know, using this little system, for right now, we're just gonna import it the way um, we have been doing it. So why don't we go to R and import that file 
Uh, well, you can do it either way. It's up to you. If, if, if this works, um, use it. Um, but, um, you know, sometimes the internet might not work, right? So it's good to just get the file. And um, um, this is actually a good thing. You can set your working directory in R to be the same uh, where you're going to have your files, your data files. That way, the paths are going to be very simple and it's easier to write the code. And you can go in R to, um, let's see, how is it, there, set directory. Yeah, set working directory. Okay, so that's a good thing to do anyway. Um, so from session, set working directory to whatever it is you're gonna work, right? Uh, and of course you should have a system, and I don't know, I don't care what your system is as long as you have one to keep all your files. So if we say set working directory, uh, if your folder is already organized, you can set that folder, or you can just say choose, right? So right now I'm gonna make my working directory um, this big folder that I'm calling with the date for today, okay? So that's gonna be my, and even though I've already downloaded the code, I, I moved the code out of that folder, which has the entire book, and put it here, right, on the top level of this folder. Um, and, you know, if I jump too far ahead, let me know, but, um, but if you need the code, you can either go to the Visualize This website or uh, everything there. Let me see what it is, yeah. So once you expand it, it will be all the chapters. And this is really good, and I, as if I remember right, the code really here is good and it works and it has all the parts that might be missing from the book. So from chapter four, these are actually all the scripts. We're just gonna do the bars one, but in the data folder, again, one advantage of that is that you don't have to define a very complicated path. You can just put stuff in parentheses and it's just gonna look immediately in that folder, right? So I'm going to import mine from the text file. Do you guys have any questions while I'm... Uh, and I'm going to try to redo it instead of reusing the, the code I used. So it's here, hot dog winners, contest winners. And once again, make sure you tell it it's got a heading and it's comma separated. Um, and when it starts looking like this and the, the header is in bold, that's good, right? So, or at least we hope it's gonna be good. Uh, so here, let's see what it looks like. It's the year, the winner, how many hot dogs they ate, the country, and whether he broke a previous record. So zero for no breaking the record, or one um, for breaking the record. Um, it's just telling you. Okay, this is the file we're gonna get. The separator is gonna be a comma, it's in parent, it's between quotation marks, then there's another comma to separate the attribute, and then there's a header. Um, and as a reminder, everything is uh, case sensitive, right? That's here that if there are spaces in the column names, R is gonna get rid of them, it just doesn't like that, right? So in this case, it put dots between um, names in the in the column okay so let's just try to plot the the bars and um, that would be bar plot right so if we go back to R uh, and here you need to start a new um, R script and we could also, for fun, just say plot and plot the name of the um, file, which, uh, what is it called, hot dog? Yeah. So remember, if you tap, if you tap it, the tap, it's gonna suggest, so I'm, I'm hitting tab now, it's gonna suggest, um, you know, options. So I'm just gonna use that. Um, And I forget what was the command to. So I you know for fun you could do this to see what stuff gets displayed, right? And immediately you start seeing that it's it's a really good case in which very few actually make kind of some sense, right? That this area right here, the others are sort of not so interesting. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna step back one moment and actually hold the whole file, but um, just to grab that one little bit. for this one Open. and right here yeah load the data what's nice about the full code from the book is that it, it's got it's got all the annotations right so whenever you put a pound sign in front of a line that means it's no code it's just a, a label it's just a description of what is going to happen uh, so i'm going to copy that and i'm going to leave it kind of handy just in case I need to go back to it. So once again, what we're doing now is just simplifying things by saying we're going to grab this data file, but we're just going to call it hot dogs, much shorter name than the actual file name. Um, but this is not going to work because, yeah. Uh, comma in this case, yeah, comma separated value. Uh, and right now I know this is not going to work. Do you guys know why it's not going to work? Let me see if it's going to work or not. Um, yeah, so we can't find it. And I can tell you if you can't think about it. So what I did is I'm telling it to go to data, but it turns out that since my working directory is already set to the... Um, yeah, actually it should, right? Shouldn't it? I should find it. Uh, no such file or directory. It's weird. Um, let's see. Well, I know for sure if I get rid of data, it's probably going to work. Oh, yeah, let's talk about this is This is a good exercise anyway to just, you know, again, keep everything straight. So my my folder right now is this, right? This one. And what I have is I have the file itself right on the first level. So that would work. But I'm, instead, I'm telling it to go to a folder called data. And that doesn't work because right here, right? So I'm in, I am in the working directory, but in my working directory, there's no folder called data. That folder is actually inside these other two levels, right? It's inside code data. It's inside chapter four. And then there's data. And then there's the file. So just, just play around and kind of find your way, right? Or however you want to organize it, it doesn't matter. So I think instead if I do is if I can get, just get rid of that line, that little word that says data, and just go straight to the file with some luck. Um, that worked, right? Because right now I don't have any errors. And usually if, if you don't have errors, um, so somewhere it's here, which is this one, right? Because it's this one that they gave it a new name, right? It's called hot dogs. So let's see. That's good. Great. So that worked. Um, and I am, uh-oh, eight. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, that again is just another way of like, okay, how do I, how do I make sure things, you know, are in the right place. So keep your stuff organized. And now I think we can proceed with all the rest. So we're going to go straight to a special plot, which is bar plot, right? Not just dots, but bars. Uh, so open the parentheses. Again, it's going to prepare them. And right now, I think I can just say hot dogs because, oh, no. Hot dogs, yes, but then dollar sign. And we need the dogs eaten, right? The hot dogs eaten, the, the, how many there are for each year. And uh, it looks like, <laughs> bless you. Uh, it looks like R will plot the graph even if you don't tell it to do all the years, right? So the years would be here, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. R is, smart, R is smart enough that says, okay, I have different values in this column called dogs eaten. So I'm just gonna lay them out um, in a sequence. It, yeah, so the next thing we're gonna do, I think, is add the, um, add the labels, uh, the years, right? So for that, it's gonna use this um, argument called names, okay? 
names argument uh, and it's going to take them from the column called year. So just going to go now back to, um, I, I was discussing earlier with, with, with Stephanie whether or not to just grab the code from the website and just have it all running here. But I think it's better if you really start doing it yourself instead of having everything, because otherwise you don't know what's going on, right? So, but it's good to have it handy, right? In this case, I want to have the file handy, which is my, my R code from the website, from the book, which is has no mistakes and also it's very nice because it has all these annotations. So right now I'm going to look for that uh, right here and I'm just cut and paste that, okay? So it's okay to do less work as long as you know where you are every time. Um, okay, so it put, the, it put the years here and of course it's skipping some because they don't fit. Uh, they might show up if I open that up. No, it's still too tight. Right? So let's not worry about that. Um, so again, these are different arguments. The ones that come before, uh, well, each one separated by a comma is an argument. Uh, this is what we're plowing, and these are the labels. So here it goes through just making the columns a different color. So we could, we could do that um, because it's saying just Oh, and setting the, adding the labels too. So let's grab it from the next. Um, or we can just do one thing at a time. So the next one will be putting the labels uh, to, the, to the axis, right? Um, yeah, so we just added this label and this label here. And anything you put between the... Uh, between the uh, your quotation marks is just going to be a string, right? So in that case, you can put any kind of crap you want. You'll just display it to the best of you know the type that it can display. But um, as long as it's within the the uh, quotation marks, it'll be accepted. Um, so in the book, then it goes on to add the color. So this is this one. And let's grab that too, so we save time. Um, so let's look at this for a moment. So again, we have the data, we have the names for the years for each column, and we're going to say it's color red. Border NA just means it's not going to put a border. Okay, so just to fill. Um, this is the X label, so that's the label at the bottom. You're telling it exactly what it is. And for the Y label, also you're telling it exactly what you want to type. So let's run that. And there they are. Um, so let's keep going, because I want to get to the separation. Okay, this is the fun part, and the one that uh, we're just gonna have, I, I may, you know, hopefully whoever listens to this video is not a, you know, doesn't get too hard on me for not using the right terminology, but it's a, you know, it's gonna create a variable and it's gonna tell the graph to do some things if a certain condition is met, if not, do something else. In this case, color, some columns, a different color. Um, the ones we're going to do are going to be the ones where the United States was the winner. And so we're actually, let's just jump. Um, let's see, what is it? Oh, sorry. Here it is where the United States is the winner. But actually the final one. Yeah. And so the statement, which is again, this variable that it's gonna be called fill colors, it's gonna do this. If the, sta if the column is the United States, make it red. If it's not, make it gray. How exactly it does it, I'm not gonna go into that now, but if you follow the syntax, and of course there's a lot of, sorry, I shouldn't highlight it here because it's not very good. If you follow the syntax, you should be able to take this piece of code and then do a di different variable. You know, you might want Germany colored, okay? So all you would have to do is change 
the name of the state, right? Now remember, you have to copy the name exactly the way it is in the database, right? Uh, so anyway, it's analyzing, you know, all the countries, and if, again, this double equals means absolutely exactly like United States, if that is true, then the fill colors are gonna be this particular color, which is, happens to be a kind of red, or else, if not, then just make them gray, which is this. And this is, you know this notation, right? It's uh, hexadecimal, I think, right? It's hexadecimal notation, so it's base 16, you get more. So it's this one. Highlight record years with color. So let's just copy that. Um, type that in. And see, now notice that actually there is nothing to nothing because once you run it, nothing happens, right? However, I think it created this thing right here, okay? Values, so I guess that stands for variable. So right here, nothing has happened, but it is in memory, right? And if you don't do this, it's later on, it's not gonna know um, that you're basically uh, wanted to do this separation, right? Um, Hello, this is just an insert, an edited insert that I added at a later stage from when the original tape was made. I'd said earlier that the um, the way the actual code worked to make those bars a different color, I wasn't going to get into it, mainly because I'm not a programmer, but I realized that even though I'm not a programmer, I think a little more explanation um, should be there. So um, first of all, this is called a for loop. And um, it, what it means is that it does one thing over and over again. So in this case, it checks over and over again, which year was a record year. So let's look at how, um, how it actually works. Um, and again, if there are pro real programmers out there listening, uh, please be understanding. Um, so it, it has to store, the, the way the loop works, it has to store all these values that it finds into what's called an empty uh, vector at first. Okay, so all these options right here um, are really the same way of saying this first line right here. So fill colors is gonna be the new uh, variable and it's going to be equal to a combination of numbers inside um, inside this parenthesis or this vector. And it has to start with an empty one because otherwise it doesn't know where to put them. Okay? But all these particular ways of writing that uh, is the same. In uh, Visualize This, this is what's used. Um, and this has to be done before the word for, before the keyword for. Um, what I did here is I, sh I showed it exactly, exactly the way it's written in the book, but you probably noticed that it's hard to follow exactly where all the uh, brackets and all the parentheses are. So let's just leave it like that, but let's look at it in another way uh, to see how it's really broken down. So this sets up the variable, the empty vector, and it says this is what it's telling it to do, which is that um, look throughout the length of this column called new record, um, and then every time you look, do this. If in the new record, there is a value that's exactly as one, then color the bars with this color. If the, value, if the value is different than one, then color the bars with this other color. And again, here you just see how each piece is sort of bracketed, okay? So let's look at all the annotations that I added here, and I'm gonna put this in a PDF at some point um, so that it's easier to, uh, to, um, to parse. Um, 
So this very first line again sets up a new variable called fill colors. Um, if you, and what this will do is it will replace the variable earlier or the argument that was simply called uh, color, uh, which made all the bars red. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so it's a little more visible. Uh, again, this beginning of the code sets up an empty vector or a list where the new values will be stored. And again, we said that in R, that is needed uh, before the loop can actually start to do the work. Uh, note that again, writing this symbol is equal to writing this symbol. Uh, C combines all the values in the vector or the list. And again, the two parentheses is technically where the values will be stored. If no arguments are inside, then the value is, is uh, null, which is what the case at the beginning um, of this process. Uh, the second line, for is a keyword, i is an index. So for each loop, the i index will go up one. Uh, in is a keyword, and this is a whole object which is the vector with the values to loop over. Now, loop, the loop starting at 1 and keeps looking as many times as there are rows in the column named new record. Um, so now this entire block has to run for every single value. And so it does it over and over again. Um, and the whole thing starts with the first first bracket until the open one until the last closed one. Um, so it looks to see if a new record was set, and the way it looks is that if some if it finds a value that's exactly that it matches perfectly the digit one, then it will. Um, the next thing it will do is again it will color, it will make these fill colors this particular hexadecimal value which happens to be a kind of red. If the value is not exactly one, could be anything, but in our case it's zero, uh, then that is otherwise fill it with this particular color which happens to be a gray, cc, cc, cc. And that's the way that for loop works. So the next thing to do would be then to um, run, uh, what is it? Oh, sorry, let me go back to right here. And now I'm a little afraid that I might lose stuff here, but no, that looks pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to copy the next line, which is basically repeating the process as before, um, except that now it specifies what kind of color it is. So before, if you remember, it was here, right? Right? It was just say, okay, make everything red, color red. But here, you would think, Oh, well, color, fill colors, that's very simple, very, how can it do that? Well, it does it because this thing, fill colors, it's actually calling up this entire thing, right? Or, or better, this entire thing is now named fill colors. So if you call it and it's working, it's going to run through this process simply by just telling it here. Let's see if it works. Yeah, and, and that's nice. Um, and, uh, and here you can play around, right? I mean, if you want, if you want say, your, your uh, fill color for the other non-record years, if you want that black, would, let's see, would that be FFF or 000? Zero, zero? Zero, okay. So if I put 000, zero, 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 zero um, and run that again, right, so that it changes. Now we have a, a, a new set here. Now if I run the other one, those are black, right? 
So that's a really nice way. And that's why, you know, you don't have to be like a programmer to get a lot done with like a few little tools, right? Um, of course, in Illustrator, you could change this easily, right? But it's nice if you start with something that's like really exact. Um, so I'm just going to change that back to CC, CC. Uh, hexadecimal doesn't matter, lowercase or uppercase, does it? Doesn't matter, okay. Uh, but here's what matters. Because it's hard to remember sometimes what something might be, just stick to lowercase whenever possible. That's good practice. Um, so run that. Again, it's loading that variable. And now it's going to be picked up here. So run it again. And there it is. OK, we're almost there. I think now we just need to add the big label, which, by the way, was not in the book, where it says, because Ren was saying, how do I get this big label to show up? And yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't obvious in the book. It was just missing, literally. Um, a couple of other things were like playing with the spacing uh, right here. It's putting the space between the columns uh, to a different value. And again, one, I guess, is default, whatever it is. And if you say less or more, maybe. Uh, so let's see what happens if we run that. Um, uh, yeah, I put a little more space. Oh, and it also put the label right here, OK? So um, that one was main. OK, that's the code to get the label, that big label right here. Right here, the code for that is just main, you know. Very economical. It's not very descriptive, but that's what it is. The, the graph's title or label uh, is going to be, and it's going to be put there unless you do something else, but that's good enough. Um, and I think that might be it. Um, what else does it talk about here? Um, oh yeah, let's do this one other thing, which is nice, which I don't know if in the book it doesn't talk about it. Somebody said, oh, how can we bring this label to actually go beyond the highest point here? For whatever reason, it only goes to to this value, which is not the highest value, right? So that's done using the Y limit. And if you wanted to extend the range here, you would do an X limit. But right now, let's just do the Y limit. So um, I'm going to try to simply edit here somewhere. Uh, I don't think it matters where. Uh, I'll put it after the Y label. So Y limit um, to syntax is equals. equals uh, C, I don't know if there has to be space. Uh, let's see. I can't remember. Let me double check on the code. Uh, well, we can always try and see if it works, right? C, and then in parentheses, just the beginning and the end, okay? So here we're just going to type zero is the beginning. And uh, we want it to be uh, higher than 60. So we're just going to say 70. Yeah. And here it actually works, which let's refresh. It's we're, we're trying to extend the axis label on the top because it was cut short relative to the highest data point. And so we told it, we told it to be at least to 70. Um, and we're going to see if it runs. Uh, no, I got a mistake because this is probably wrong here. Oh, I forgot the comma after my, OK? Give me an error. Let's see what the error is. Sometimes the errors uh, messages are good. Sometimes they're not. They're not. Like from this, you wouldn't know that I forgot the comma. but. You do need a comma after every argument, right? So I'm going to put the comma in there. Oh, really? Let's see. Oh, OK. I guess I didn't select it. 
Um, did it work? Yeah, here it is. Okay, this is very convenient now. It's also next to each other between the code. So this bit of code, it's now pushing up the label. It's extending the label. And I think now let's just, just for kicks, let's just do an export of this graph. Um, and you do that from export right here. Uh, save as PDF and uh, bar graph hot dogs dot PDF. Uh, you can set the directory. I'm just repeating this for, and I'm gonna set the directory in the same place where I have everything else. So I'm just gonna say that's my directory. Then save it. Oops. Uh, okay. I didn't change the uh, the format, so that's what I'm getting. I'm not crazy about that. Uh, I'm gonna make it instead a little more rectangular the other way. So save as PDF here. Make sure you put, and this will affect your shape for better or for worse. It's not very scientific, but right now by making it uh, let's say us legal and by making it landscape i'm just going to have it the other way around um, to pdf save oops and that's good uh, okay so now it actually opened it in preview which I, it's not what i want but it looks pretty good what you want to do really is open it in Illustrator. And since I'm doing this, I'm now just going to say a few more things that I've repeated so uh, before, but how to, a few, a few things to do when you import it from Illustrator uh, into Illustrator, rather the PDF. Uh, so we get them all on the video. It will be a good introduction. So if I open that PDF, um, uh, the first thing to do is you select all and you get rid of the clipping mask which in this case looks like it's not there but sometimes it is so you would release it and once you release it then it's easier to get rid of elements that are not needed like extra, li extra lines etc and Okay. Uh, another thing to remember is that an object is really always two objects: a fill and a and a and a, um, and a and a border are two objects. Once you import it into Illustrator, but in this case we didn't have a, a border, so it doesn't apply. Uh, and if you wanted to, I'm just going to repeat this trick. If you wanted to add even more points here, the way I do it is I select this little tick mark. I duplicate and I bring it up to the next one and then I duplicate it again by pressing command D and then I do the same with this and I need to change that to 80 and also I want to remember to get rid of the extra one here because otherwise that might cause problems and then just extend this line okay so you can always fix things in Illustrator but you know that could introduce problems right so you always want to try to do everything in art first okay uh, that is it